Welcome back. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, and welcome to the State Department. Happy Wednesday. Um, just one thing uh, fairly quickly at the top. Um, uh, the Maldives, uh, the sentencing of Sheikh Imran. We are concerned that another Maldivian opposition leader has been sentenced to a lengthy prison term after a deeply flawed and uh, judicial process. Opposition leader Sheikh Imran was sentenced yesterday to 12 years in prison for speaking at an opposition rally. Imran is the third prominent politician to receive a lengthy sentence in just the past 12 months. In each instance, the government failed to provide an appropriate, or rather failed to provide appropriate procedural and substantive protections in accordance with Maldivian law and Maldives international obligations. We renew our call uh, for the Maldivian government to end politically motivated trials and to take steps to restore confidence in a commitment to democracy and human rights, including freedom of expression and the rule of law and judicial independence. That's all I got at the top. Right. Um, so listen, before we go into perhaps uh, weightier policy issues of the day, I wanted sure. to just do a logistical thing. Yeah. And that, I'm wondering if you can give us um, – any more detail at all about this meeting that the secretary had out in Hollywood with these uh, film studio executives. He, in his tweet, said that he was there hearing perspectives and ideas on how to counter the Dash narrative. And I'm just wondering if you can be more specific about, I mean, is was he asking their advice on how to do this, or was he suge suggesting sure. things? I mean, uh, does this, I, is, I, he, is he looking for the next uh, Wolverine movie to be Wolverine versus ISIS? What's, what's I mean, the uh, – what, what, Kidding what is aside, it? I mean – No, I, no, 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 of course. I mean, the, I mean, look, he, it was – it was uh, he had the chance to meet with uh, a number of senior executives uh, in the entertainment industry. I mean, these are the people, uh, I think, uh, widely recognized who are – some of the best communicators out there, uh, and they run a highly profitable uh, industry uh, that uh, is uh, expert at conveying messages uh, to a worldwide audience. So I think he sought their, not I think, he sought their perspectives and uh, input uh, about how the United States and, and uh, the rest of the coalition, the anti-Dash coalition, uh, can better counter the propaganda that's being put forward by ISIL. I mean, a lot of it was a discussion, uh, you know, on a give and take on what's what they think works and what doesn't work. And I can't, I don't want to get into the details because it was just an introductory meeting. But I think it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think the secretary felt it was worthwhile uh, to have the opportunity to meet with these folks and get their input on what they think. Okay. Is, a, so, is, a, is an effective strategy. So he was soliciting them on ideas about how to counter their messaging, not the other way around. He wasn't saying, hey, listen, we think it would be a great idea if you guys did X, X, and X. No, no, I think, I mean, look, I think, no, no, I, I think he was, he was seeking their perspectives on our own efforts to counter Dash and, and ISIL okay. in terms well, of messaging. But you're not planning on, like, outsourcing the whole CBE no. message to Hollywood film studios, are you? No, no, gosh. Uh, you know, but I think, you know, I, I mean, it's important that, that that they're part of this conversation. I mean, they're, again, I, you know, they have, uh, you know, more so than diplomats and even public diplomacy professionals like myself, I freely admit that, you know, uh, folks in Hollywood and Silicon Valley and uh, uh, who are uh, uh, who are really um, experts in uh, conveying uh, messages, whether it's through film or through entertainment, uh, are worthwhile uh, to listen to and to get, seek. We should be seeking their advice on how we can do our job better. Can, can you cite yeah. an example where actually Hollywood and the government were able to, you know, sort of coordinate together to have a powerful message or film done? I mean, in the past, is there anything? World War II. In World War II, yeah. okay. I mean, John but, Houston you know, since World War II. But no, that's okay. Say, I mean, it's a, you know, it's since a, World War II, yeah, I mean, yeah. during the Vietnam, Vietnam War, there was the yes. Green Beret, for instance. Right. You know, yeah. or Top Gun or something. Top Gun. Yeah, I mean, this is. But, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, this is. Can, can, we, can, can we move no, on to something I mean, a little no, bit no, more? Yeah, I mean, I have more meetings with these people. I, I mean, and again, I don't want to say that yesterday they were inking deals on movies to, that will come out. All he was doing was he was taking advantage of the fact that he was there uh, just outside of Hollywood in L.A., uh, where the movie industry exists, 
he wanted to seek their input on how we can message better. I mean, these guys, as I said, are professionals. You did say it was an introductory meeting. It was an introductory meeting, exactly. So are there, is this going to be a- I have nothing to announce, but I think, you know, it was a first meeting. I think- So there will be a sequel. We would like to see more. Sequel. I'll give you that, yeah. Can we go to China? Yes. Today, the Secretary said he was seeking serious, very serious discussions with China on the missile at the center of the South China Sea. What did he mean by that, and when does he plan to have those serious discussions? Well, first of all, you're talking about, right, the- The commercial imagery seems to indicate that China has deployed surface-to-air missile systems. Can you confirm? Are you confirming that? Yes, I am confirming that commercial imagery appears to indicate that China has deployed surface-to-air missile system on a disputed outpost in the South China Sea. If this is true, we believe this will raise tensions further in the region. As you know, there was a declaration in Sunny Lance yesterday, President Obama and the other leaders of ASEAN countries confirmed that we do share a commitment to maintaining peace, security, and stability in the region. And that includes freedom of navigation and overflight and other lawful uses of the seas and unimpeded lawful maritime commerce as described in the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So, back to your question about Secretary's remarks, I think he was simply stating that we've heard, and he actually studied the example of President Xi when he was here in the Rose Garden, said that China will not militarize South China Sea. But there is increasing evidence that that's not the case, that there has been an increase in militarization of one kind or another. And certainly, as I said, if what we've seen in the commercial satellite imagery does bear out that there are surface-to-air missiles, that would be, we would consider, of serious concern. I think, again, I don't have anything to announce in terms of any meetings or any phone calls, except to say that he did promise that there would be conversations in the very near future, in the very near term, with China about this, about this development. And, you know, again, it simply comes back to the fact that it's very important, and China knows this and has said that it is also committed to resolving these kinds of jurisdictional issues through diplomacy and by working with other countries and claimants and trying to resolve these differences. And, frankly, militarization is counterproductive to that effort, obviously. Let's go to Sarah. Yeah. Go ahead. Finish up. Stay on. Go ahead, Pam. Is there a sense in this building that the, concerning the timing of this deployment from China, is there a sense in this building that this was done sort of as a rebuke to the ASEAN summit or? It's a fair question, Pam. I'm not sure in terms of, you know, how long these missiles have been in place. Again, it's, this is, we're relying right now on what commercial imagery appears to indicate. I have no idea whether the timing is such that it happened in the last couple of days or was any way. That's a question, frankly, for the Chinese to answer. You're relying on commercial satellite imagery? In this case, I'm talking about this instance. You don't have your own eyes on it? I mean, I realize you can't talk about it, but. We're confirming through our various other means and channels, yes. So it's not a question of what, if it's true. It is a question of the Chinese have done this. And now what are you going to do about it, if anything? It seemed from the Secretary's remarks that the administration is disappointed that, from your point of view, the Chinese aren't living up to what President Xi said in the Rose Garden with President Obama. Is that correct? And then secondly, you note that you point out the Sunnyland Statement, but China is not a signatory to that. So just because they've put these missiles there doesn't necessarily mean that they are opposed to a diplomatic solution, does it? Or 
does it mean that in your estimation? No. So, I mean, what I think we're saying is militarization of the islands, or of the South China Sea, rather, is obviously counterproductive to any kind of peaceful or diplomatic resolution among the various claimants. So what we want to see is dispute settlement mechanisms put in place, and this has long been a discussion among the ASEAN nations, and we want to see vehicles for arbitration so that these things can be discussed in diplomatic channels. Militarization would include what? Putting these missiles up there and sending ships or planes, naval military ships or planes to the area? Again, some of the actions that we've seen China take. Aren't you guys doing that, too? No, but ours is different. I mean, we are. No, I mean, it's. I mean, how is it? And you've heard our explanation. I mean, I know that you're not planting missile silos on islands in the South China Sea, but you're sending, you know, large naval vessels through and flying over with military planes, are you not? Well, as. That doesn't count as militarization, right? It does not. It counts as freedom. It is basically freedom of navigation. But anything the Chinese does. That's not the same as building airstrips and putting surface-to-air missiles on these and actually building up some of these islands in order to support the infrastructure. My last one was the. What's Kirby's line about not freedom of navigation, not just for whales? Whales and seals. That's what he said. But what about President Xi? You're accusing him of. You're accusing the Chinese of not living up to President Xi's VAT pledge or whatever, however you want to. If it, in fact, turns out, and we can confirm through our own means that these are surface-to-air missiles, then, as I said, then that's, you know, that's a step backwards. Can we go to Syria? So you are, other than the commercial satellite imagery, you are pursuing your own other independent ways of verifying this? Yes. Okay. Can we go to Syria? Yeah, let's finish up with this. Sorry. Would you say that, I mean, given China's own provocative actions in the South China Sea, that it's no longer a reliable partner to address North Korean provocations? No. I mean, we've talked a lot about the fact that we want to see China take a more proactive role in engaging with North Korea to try to get it to refrain from additional provocative actions and to pursue denuclearization on the peninsula. But that's wholly unrelated to its actions in the South China Sea. But it does show the breadth and importance of our security dialogue with China. And we're going to continue to press them where we can, hold them accountable where we feel they should be held accountable. And that goes to every issue, whether it's human rights, whether it's South China Sea, whether it's DPRK. And DPRK, now, they are in agreement that North Korea's actions are a threat to the region's security and stability. They agree with us on that. We want to see more stringent action taken to rein North Korea in. So that dialogue continues. And that was, you know, when the Secretary was recently in Beijing, we had those discussions. Those discussions continue. Stay with North Korea? Sure, let's stay with North Korea. In the wake of North Korea's ballistic missile launch and also nuclear tests, there's a sanctions bill that is sitting on the President's desk. Is it safe to say that a year later, strategic patience is not working? I think, Lucas, you know, we – I think North Korea has indicated through its recent actions an unwillingness to come back to negotiations, six-party talks. There is a mechanism in place. We've said many, many times over the past years, no, we don't want that to simply serve as a forum for talking for talk's sake. When North Korea is serious about answering some of those questions about denuclearizing, then we're ready to go back to that format. But I think – sorry, just to answer your question, I think there's also a realization given the past actions, and these are being pursued not only bilaterally or unilaterally, rather, but also within the Security Council of the need for additional actions on North Korea. Do you think sending those F-22 fighter jets will help? 
Um, look, I mean, those are uh, – you're talking about the F-22s to South Korea? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's – you know, I mean, part of that is reassurance to our strong allies and partners in the regions that, uh, you know, we take their concerns, their security concerns seriously. Please, Mr. Yeah. Very quickly, can, can you first update us on any – Possible uh, diplomatic de uh, developments that have, you have done achieved over the past 48 hours or 30, 24 hours. <laughs> right. A uh, couple of things to mention, mm -hmm. I think, worth mentioning. So we can confirm that UN and humanitarian partner convoys comprising mm -hmm. 100 trucks mm -hmm. are en route from Damascus to five besieged areas in Syria, including the Idlib towns of El Fua and Kafraya, uh, and the reef, the Damascus towns of El Zabadani mm -hmm. uh, and Medaya and Muad Muadamiya, sorry, mm. forgive me if the pronunciation is incorrect there. Mm. Uh, convoys, uh, these convoys include uh, life-saving uh, relief supplies uh, for tens of thousands of besieged Syrians. Now, you know, this is great. This is right. a step forward. But um, I would be clear that this is just a first step in dealing with uh, the significant uh, problem uh, of humanitarian assistance in these besieged areas. And frankly, it's a problem that never should have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Assad regime should have allowed this access uh, long ago. And we're still very concerned that the Syrian agree uh, regime has thus far only agreed to what they call temporary access right. to these besieged communities. Okay. We obviously want to see uh, permanent access. So you don't expect this to be a permanent thing? It's probably a one-time thing? Is that it? Again, I, I think we'll wait and see, but yeah. what we've heard from the regime thus far is that it's kind of, they said temporary. They use yeah. that terminology. Okay. And that's obviously of concern but, to all members of the ISSG. But if we see this as, you know, happening every other week or every week or something like this, would that be a good gesture from the Syrian government that can perhaps, you know, sort of legitimize its well, we've efforts about that. in and the that's, political yeah, process? No, I mean, it's a good question, Saeed. I mean, you know, first of all, we're hoping to build on this access. Um, the U.N. Uh, uh, will determine the priority for U.N. its own uh, deliveries, but uh, this is, you know, a first initial step. We talked a lot about, you know, especially with the Geneva talks uh, set to begin again next week, uh, to reconvene next week uh, between the opposition and the regime. Uh, we've talked about, you know, having some kind of concrete progress uh, to point to on the ground, uh, whether it's uh, with regard to a cessation of hostilities uh, or uh, access to uh, some of these besieged areas. So this would fall into that. And on, on the issue of uh, more involvement by other countries uh, in Syria, can you confirm, or, you know, I don't know if you would, uh, the, that the Saudis uh, have sent in a squadron of fighter jets, F-16s, to the Interlake Air Base, which, you know, where you have, where the United States keeps its, its uh, Well, I know there was discussion in Brussels well, last also, week. I, I uh -huh. can't confirm that that's actually taken place. Right. I know there was discussion among defense ministers right. of the uh, anti-Daesh coalition last week in Brussels mm -hmm. that, that Saudi would be providing um, uh, but, uh, airstrikes or fighters, uh, to the coalition's effort. I, I can't confirm that that's that they've arrived in injury. Like I just but they know. also say that they send in special unit, special forces unit that w would allegedly work with American special forces unit that are present in the same area. Is that something that you can comment on? I can't. Okay. Mark, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. Are sure, you sure. saying that yeah. the Munich agreement did not call for a cessation, cessation of hostilities within a week of it being uh, no, I, I think it did, yeah. I mean, I, I oh, think it did. Yeah. Okay. But you yeah. seem to Sorry, be saying that it only called for progress, concrete progress on the ground to enable the peace talks to resume or uh, to, yeah, to right. start. And, and, and you and seem to be saying that it was an advice. either. Yeah. Sorry, go you ahead. seem to be saying it was an either or proposition that concrete progress could be either these aid convoys getting in or it could be a cessation sure. of hostilities okay. agreement. That's just not the case. The Munich agreement calls for both of those things, not and doesn't make it an either or proposition. And it also said that the aid to these uh, seven communities should have been delivered last week, not today, Wednesday the, what is it, 18th, 17th? Um, so I don't, I don't understand. So Are you backtrack? Is, is, is the administration, is the ISSG, which agreed to this Munich thing, backtracking on its commitments? So there were, as you know, um, timelines discussed in Munich last week. Um, 
and I didn't want to convey that we're somehow disregarding those. I, I think, though, uh, all, and all I was trying to convey uh, in, in answering Saeed's question was the fact that we need to be able to show progress right. on both fronts, uh, I think, okay. uh, going back. forward. And I think that that would be, that would help get the opposition back uh, to Geneva if they saw concrete action taken on the ground. But uh, it's is both, this, not either or. No, no, both. Okay. Um, and, and just, you know, an update on the, 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 uh, the ceasefire task force that is scheduled to meet uh, February 19th in Geneva. Um, and that'll be convened under UN auspices, uh, co-chaired uh, by the U.S. and by Russia, but open to all uh, ISSG uh, members. Um, and, uh, you know, that's recognizing that's a, a week after these, this was announced in, or a week plus a day after it was announced in Munich. Um, well, no, we'll give you the, it was past midnight. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Thank so you. We'll give you, um, you give you till Friday. No, I mean, but, uh, but you I have mean, until rec- Friday to get, we, we to get the cessation, not rec- to, to have a meeting about it. I understand it. that. And, I, and we recognize that, you know, you have to set deadlines. We've talked about this before, whether it's in terms of uh, Iran and nuclear deal or, or whatever issue we're working on. We have to set deadlines. Frankly, we would have liked this two months ago. We didn't get there. We're pushing now. Mm-hmm. We have, we're, we're pushing as fast as possible on this, recognizing that on both sides, there have to be consultations on the ground before this group can come together and meet and seriously talk about a cessation of this hostilities. Um, so the, you mentioned that the, uh, the, 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 the ceasefire task force yep. is co-chaired by the U.S. and Russia. Uh, the language of the Munich Agreement says, and including political and military officials with participation of ISSG members. So any, anyone who wants to, anyone who's in the ISSG can have political and military officials at the task force meeting. Is that correct? That is my understanding, yes. So that includes Iran. So I don't understand. For, for months and months and months, the administration has said there's no way it's going to cooperate fully with Russia let alone Iran, on any military component of what's going on in Syria. I mean, over and over and over again. And the Russians were pushing, pushing, pushing. That's what they wanted. They wanted maps to show where the rebels are that you support. You said people claimed that that was disingenuous, that they only wanted to know their location so that they could go after them. Um, but now that's one of the main things that this task force is, is, is tasked with doing, which is to draw up, the, to delineate areas held by groups that are eligible and ineligible for the ceasefire. So I don't understand how you're going to sit down now militarily with the Russians and, and the Iranians, if the Iranians want to, and coordinate with them if you haven't changed your position on whether on, on cooperation with the Russians, let alone the Iranians. So um, just to, and just to, Clearly, so the our, the U.S. delegation, and then I'll answer your question, mm-hmm. uh, to this task force is going to be led by uh, Rob Malley, who's the special assistant to the president, <coughs> and White House coordinator for the Middle East, uh, North Africa, and Gulf region. And the U.S. delegation will also include State Department officials. Um, you know, uh, you are right uh, in that, uh, you know, in the past uh, few months, uh, we have been uh, hesitant uh, uh, to cooperate more robustly on uh, on airstrikes and targeting of some of these groups um, with Russia because we hadn't seen, and we've talked about this a lot, that it was really even targeting Daesh or ISIL in its airstrikes. I I would just say the frame's a little different here in the sense that, um, we're, and, and the, the, I mean, there needs to be, I think, coordination uh, among all the members of the ISSG uh, on the ground if we're going to get to a credible cessation of hostilities and eventually a, a ceasefire. Because, um, you know, one of the things that also came out of Munich was, you know, it's going to be incumbent on not just Russia, not just Iran and, the, and their influence on the regime, but various other members of the ISSG to exert influence where we see whatever backsliding or uh, forces, whether it's the regime or members of the opposition who are reluctant to join the ceasefire. Um, you know, once we get a ceasefire in place, uh, we can then attempt to police that, or it will be self-policing. And we've talked a little bit about that before. But I think at some level, you're going to have to, we're going to have to do that and, and have that kind of 
coordination and awareness okay. on both sides. But that means that the administration has decided that it is now comfortable coordinating military operations with Iran, a country the administration believes is the world's leading sponsor, state sponsor of terrorism, which supports Hezbollah, which is active on the battlefield and which is a U.S. designated foreign terrorist organization. So I, I don't get how you, how you guys can do that, can, can agree to coordinating military operations with Iran and then by extension Hezbollah when, by legally. How do, you, how, how, how do you do that? These are state, a state sponsor of terrorism in your estimation and a foreign terrorist organization. How does that work? Well, again, I mean, we, you know, we, we you know, when we created this international serious support group, uh, we made the, the decision that it needed to be open to all, quote unquote, stakeholders in uh, Syria. And so that included Iran. That was that was a major step, uh, mm -hmm. um, not just on our part, but on the part of others uh, in the ISSG to include them in that process, fully recognizing that if we don't get their buy-in, uh, we're never going to get a credible ceasefire, which is not. I mean, you know, as you point out, they do have uh, boots on the ground through various forms. Um, I'm not going to speak to your other question, which is how do we legally do that? I mean, I think the ISSG in and of itself is going to, again, the various members are going to exert influence where they can on the forces on the ground to enact that ceasefire. I can't get into too much detail about the mechanisms or the modalities or whatever of the cease of the ceasefire or cessation of hostilities. Uh, I think I'll just stop there. All right. Yeah, well, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Turkey. Turkey. Uh, that seems uh, that was an explosion. Ankara yes. killed over 20. Do you have any initial comments? For well, that? Uh, obviously, we express our sincere condolences to uh, the dead and injured. Uh, uh, this is obviously also still a preliminary uh, uh, news or preliminary facts coming in about the extent, and I don't think we have a, any uh, claim of responsibility yet. Um, but we've seen these reports. Uh, the embassy is working to determine if any U.S. citizens uh, were involved, and uh, we stand by uh, to provide any and all consular assistance. Uh, the U.S. Embassy also issued an, uh, an emergency warden <coughs> message to U.S. citizens urging them to avoid the area uh, and to monitor local news uh, for updates. Um, at this point, I would just say we refer you to Turkish authorities for more details. Yesterday, Turkish President Erdogan uh, directly mentioned you, so I'm going to let you respond to uh, well, did, he, did he directly? Yes, yes, uh, spokesman I, of the Somehow I missed that. U.S. Uh, he, he come up in my Google, uh, sorry, <laughs> alert. <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, he, uh, he said that here is the spokesman remarks from yesterday. Uh, uh, telling you that uh, you, you said we're going to continue to help YPG, uh, but also YPG is making things difficult, as you were talking about Minak uh, Airbase yesterday. Right. And uh, there are a lot of accusations yesterday. It was pretty long, longer than usual, uh, Erdogan uh, uh, remarks on U.S., uh, he said that weapons given to PYD turning against our security officials. He said that this is blindless, blind, U.S. policy is blind to say that PYD and PKK uh, has no links. Uh, yeah, do, do, do you have any Sure. Um, uh, I'll just do Mark. Yeah, sure, he sure. said that he's having difficulty understanding why U.S. cannot call Syrian Kurdish PYD a terrorist organization. And uh, he added that ignoring link between PYD and PKK is a hostile attitude against Turkey. Is a what attitude? Hostile, hostile, attitude. hostile attitude. Not at all. Um, first off, um, you know, I respectfully um, acknowledge uh, um, President Erdogan's remarks. Um, as many of you in this room know, we just have a difference of opinion here about the role of the YPG uh, and its links to uh, PKK, who we fully admit is a foreign terrorist organization and support Turkey's efforts uh, to combat uh, the PKK. Um, that said, 
you know, I was very clear yesterday, and I can reiterate what I said yesterday, which is that, uh, you know, we are aware that YPG forces have attempted to take and recently taken additional territory um, outside of Afrin uh, and including uh, um, areas close to Azaz, which includes, as you mentioned, uh, Manah Air Base. And we called these moves uh, both publicly but also uh, privately in our conversations with the YPG uh, leadership uh, counterproductive and uh, said that they undermine uh, our collective cooperative efforts to uh, degrade and defeat Daesh. Uh, and so uh, we have reached out to the YPG leadership uh, to urge that it refrain uh, from further escalating tensions in the region. Same subject. He also says that uh, many of the weapons turning up against our security officials in Turkey. This is pretty uh, heavy accusations. We've also been clear that we have not provided weaponry uh, to the YPG. Please, Michael. Uh, just follow up on your message yesterday. Also, you know, you stressed Turkey needs to stop attacking I did. the Kurds in Syria. I did. And just wanted to today he relieve said, you all of my further right. going into my talking points, yeah. but you're absolutely right. Well, he also said that he's going to continue the shelling. Is he not listening? Has, has he responded to the U.S. on this? Has um, he rejected your call to stop? I, I don't believe so. I mean, uh, we, we have very frank and, uh, and, and productive exchanges with Turkey, uh, with uh, uh, the Turkish government. Uh, they're a NATO ally and partner in uh, – countering Daesh in the region, um, we've expressed our views, made it clear that uh, just as the YPG, as I said, is, its actions are very counterproductive, but we've also uh, told the uh, or conveyed to the Turkish government uh, that it should cease its uh, artillery fire across the border. But what do you say they're, they're ignoring these, they're ignoring, ignoring your demands? Um, Again, I don't. I, I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't say it that way. And I would also say that you know we've not seen any recent uh, artillery fire. Uh, he said he's going to continue hours, it so. too. Yeah. I'm aware of that. But and what, uh, one more question. Sorry. Um, is yeah, there an obstacle with because of these heightened tensions with arming both sides, with the U.S. providing arms to both sides of this, Turkey, and as, as you mentioned, some of the complications, Turkey and the Kurds in Syria. Sure. Turkey, first of all, and I, I, if I didn't express this clearly, um, we've never provided, uh, as I said, weaponry or arms to uh, the YPG. We've supported them through a variety of means, including well, airstrikes and yeah. other. Well, let's say a military yeah. support, maybe is a better word. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, again, I think um, also without getting into too much operational detail, which frankly is, is better directed to the DOD, you know, the YPG sub, uh, groups that we're supporting, um, there are various parts of the YPG uh, on the ground in Syria. And the one, the, the groups that we're supporting are actually not the same groups. Obviously, they're part of the same organization, but not these ones who are taking territory in and around um, Aleppo. Uh, and so uh, the, the groups that we've been supporting through airstrikes, through various means, have actually continued to uh, effectively fight uh, ISIL on the ground in northern Syria. But isn't Turkey shelling them? Uh, I'm not aware that they're – no, my, my understanding, of course, and again, I, I defer to my uh, Department of Defense colleagues, but uh, my understanding is that uh, the shelling of YPG positions is directed at those groups in and around uh, Afrin and Azaz. On, on this, Mark, please. Yes, sir. We understand. Uh, the U.S. has supported or has been supporting the uh, PYD and YPG uh, and these groups, reports coming from, news reports coming from Aleppo saying that these groups are also supported by Russia and the Syrian regime. And these groups are fighting with FSA who are supported by the U.S. And both of them are using American arms. Can you explain this for us, please? <laughs> that was a really uh, – and I acknowledge it's a complex situation, but one more time, you're saying that whether they're cooperating with and being provided weaponry from Russia and the regime. We've not seen any indication of that. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I won't speak to any other country's engagement uh, with local group, groups in Syria. Um, uh, but, 
you know, we have been very clear in our message to the YPG uh, uh, that taking additional territory around is Oz, uh, Afrin and Azaz uh, are heightening tensions with Turkey. But all the news reports coming from there said yesterday and today and before that yeah. that Russia and the Syrian regime are coordinating with the, uh, with YPG uh, in this area. That they're coordinating with them on the ground. Yes. Again, we've seen no evidence other than that these different groups may be taking advantage of of the situation, and we've talked about this uh, over the last couple of days, uh, that it's not uncommon to see this kind of, whatever, however you want to term it, land grab or whatever, and then run up to a, a ceasefire. Please. The YPG has been seen uh, driving uh, an American-made uh, vehicles and uh, armored personnel carry, even a tank, uh, uh, at one point. How do they get it? Hmm? I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. Matt, Matt raises a valid point, and that is, you know, there the is there is yeah. the reality of the uh, situation in both Syria and in Iraq is that you know, equipment and and various weaponry, uh, while given to uh, the quote unquote good guys, somehow yeah, sometimes ends up in, in the hands of the quote unquote bad guys. Please, Michael. Mark. I have on this, Mark. Can you tell us? Who is your biggest ally in the area against the jihadists? This is a question. Yeah, no, it's not it's a, a question to whom you are giving arms. The question, who is fighting with you against the jihadists? Well, Michael, my answer to that is, you know, I'm not going to give a grade to any one group or any one member of the coalition. What I'm going to say is that every member of the coalition fulfills a various role. And as you know, this coalition involves various lines of effort. And, you know, we focus a lot in this room, in this briefing room, on the kinetic part, the military part, and that's important. And we've talked very clearly about the fact that not just the YPG, not just the Syrian Kurds, Syrian Arab groups, and other groups, including the Turkmen, in northern Syria have been uh, effective in taking the fight to ISIL. And in, in, as part of our strategy, and you know this has evolved over many months, we recognize that it's better in, uh, that to uh, provide support to these groups. It's a more effective use, uh, frankly, of uh, our efforts uh, to provide support to these groups who are already showing success in destroying Daesh on the ground and taking back territory from Daesh. I don't want to in any way undermine or, or uh, under uh, – uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to in any way um, uh, say – or convey that uh, any other member of this anti-Dash coalition is uh, not doing enough or not fulfilling uh, an important role. There's lots of different roles within that uh, coalition, um, you know, but we fully recognize, and ourselves included, we all need to do more. Mark, you said you have seen no indication that YPG is supported by any other country. The Syrian government's envoy to UN, Bashar Jafari, said yesterday that this, uh, I'm quoting exactly his words. This Syrian Kurds supported by the American administration are also supported by the Syrian government, just for your information. That's what he said. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 no so comment. You still say that they are not supported by any other country? Yeah, guys, I, you know, I, I, respectfully, I know there's a lot of interest in, but let's, uh, are we, can we take one more question on the... Just, just no, 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 subject. just, a, just okay. to clarify something. You said that the Turkish artillery shelling has stopped. Uh, since when? We, we've heard it, 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 I've seen reports that it stopped, but I, you know, I can't speak to. Uh, are you when in contact happened. with the Turkish official to stop this artillery shelling? Well, I mean, are you in contact with the Turkish officials to? Well, of to course, we're in contact with uh, Turkish officials. You mean to stop them? I mean, we've urged. No, them. to urge to urge them. Yes, we've conveyed our. So, you, can you confirm that at least? Prime Minister. Thank you. Yes, and Vice President that? Biden yes. is referring to Vice President Biden's call, and you know, we talk at. A number of levels, as you know, every day. Yeah, but with, uh, if, if, I mean, since you are in contact with the Turkish officials, you, uh, you, do you have any knowledge about when this artillery shelling gets stopped? I don't have a date certain or a time certain. I'm just aware. Since last day, I don't know. Okay, the last one. Are you mediating with uh, between the YPG forces and U.S.-backed forces on the ground in Maria Line, especially? Uh, because there is a negotiation between YPG and U.S. backed forces in, on the ground to take over Mare. Are you mediating between them? 
I, I can't speak to the details of that. I just don't have that kind of level of detail. Sorry. Please. Uh, a different subject. No, 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 no. One more. Please. Oh, I'll see you. Just said, please, you just said, Michelle. Yeah, Let's yeah. move along. No, no, we no, have no. time at the end because I, I actually have to. On, yes. on off-line zone, uh, Councillor uh, Merkel has said today that... Uh, I'm aware of her remarks, and I'll, I don't mean to cut you off, but I'm aware of her remarks. Our position on no-fly zones remains the same, Michelle. The OPCW had a report out a few days ago, or sorry, there were reports that the OPCW had confirmed that mustard gas was being used by ISIS in Iraq. Um, I was wondering if you had any comment on that, but also if there was any indication as to whether uh, you felt it was being made by them or had been procured from the Syrian government? Uh, hold on one second. I, I do have something on that. I apologize. Um, so we believe that uh, the Islamic State for Iraq and the Levant, ISIL, or Daesh, uh, was responsible for a sulfur mustard attack in Morea in August 21st, 2015, largely based on photographic evidence as well as a Syrian opposition's description of the event. Uh, we also believe, based on the available information, that uh, Daesh or ISIL was likely responsible for some of the alleged attacks using sulfur mustard in Iraq. So was read. Do you have another question? Or? I have a related question sure. about um, weapons in Iraq. There's a Reuters story that the, uh, ra some radioactive material was stolen from a um, U.S. oil firm in uh, Iraq, something the size of a lap laptop computer that there are fears could be used to make a dirty bomb or something that is dangerous. Are these real fears? Do you know about this stolen material? And is it, is it actually something to be concerned about? Well, we're aware of the reports that there may be a lost, uh, maybe lost or a missing radioactive source in Iraq. Uh, we've not seen any indication the material in question has been acquired by uh, Daesh or any other terrorist uh, groups in the region. But obviously, we continue uh, to take uh, these uh, reports very seriously, and we continue to monitor the situation. Do you, do you have reason to believe that it's dangerous material? Could it be used to create a dangerous weapon? Yeah, um, right. Uh, so uh, based on the information uh, provided, we, we can't speculate on the suitability of the, uh, of the materials uh, for use in, as you say, a, a dirty bomb or a radiological dispersal device. What, you say you're not aware of any indication that has been acquired by Daesh or any other terrorist group. I said we've not seen any indication. We've not the seen has any indication. By ISIL. Well, would you? I mean, so do you have it? If, if, if you're basically saying you don't know where it is. Uh, again, we're going to leave it where I where I where I've said what I just said with what I just said rather. We're aware of reports uh, that this uh, uh, radioactive source has gone lost or missing. We just right. have, and we've not seen any indications that it's been acquired well, by. Well, what what does that mean? I mean, I mean that it was stolen. The first report was that it was stolen. So, uh, which is different than missing. Um, and and and, and and your comment would suggest that maybe you believe they just lost it rather than it was stolen. Is that um, what you're saying? I'm going to refer you to the Iraqi government for. What kind of sign would you? Be, well, what kind of indication? An explosion? Would that indicate that? I don't. I don't get. I don't get what that I mean, means. It, you, it's a valid would you question. see? Would you see? What, what kind of indication would you have that they have? That they have? Well, if they're trying mean, to keep it secret. Then, granted, but you, there's ways to. As we've <clears> all right. Well, speaking many of times, with, speaking of ways concerns, to tra trace radioactive material. Fair enough. Speaking of concerns, yesterday you said you were. Uh, uh, you didn't have any. You didn't know of any concern about the possible uh, sale of Sukhoi advanced Sukhoi uh, to uh, Iran by Russia. I'm wondering if you guys have decided that whether or not the, this possibility is of concern. Uh, and then related to that, um, both the Russians and the Iranians are saying that the S-300 missile system delivery will begin tomorrow. Um, do you have any comment on that? Uh, just on the S-300, we've made clear objections to any sale uh, of the S-300 missile to Iran for quite a few years now. Uh, Secretary Kerry has raised it with Lavrov, Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, multiple occasions. We've long objected to the sale uh, of the sale. We've long objected to the sale uh, to Iran of such sophisticated defense capabilities. Uh, we're going to continue to monitor it. Uh, I don't have any about the Sukhoi. I'll, I'll, I'll take that question. Would that violate the UN that sale, the Sukhois or uh, uh, I don't know. I don't have that in front of me. I mean, if obviously, uh, and I said this yesterday, is um, 
you know, we, uh, you know, we would uh, look at not only this particular sale, but any specific transactions that we have concerns about. Um, we would both look at how we would respond both within our own unilateral uh, abilities to uh, uh, to impose sanctions, uh, which we still retain, uh, or also uh, we would make sure that uh, that they don't violate any UN Security Council resolutions. And lastly, whether it's yep. Syria, North Korea, and launching a ballistic missile into space, or now China putting uh, surface terror missiles on one of its islands, is it safe to say that the uh, is it safe? No, <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. It, is the is strategic patience still a swing thought of this administration's foreign policy? Um, that's a that's a really big picture uh, foreign policy uh, concept for me to uh, tackle uh, 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 from this podium today. Um, and I also don't think that strategic patience necessarily applies to every uh, given crisis in the world. Um, you know, it is a valid approach. Uh, uh, in some cases, uh, but, uh, you know, certainly, and the President and the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense have all been very clear that, uh, you know, we always reserve the right, whether it's Iran, whether it's uh, whoever, uh, um, when they flout international law, when they uh, go against uh, UN Security Council resolutions, that we will take action when the, as needed. But is it working? Is what working? Strategic patience? Mm -hmm. uh, again, I don't, and I'm not going to, you know, attempt to. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, Good question. I think, I think, look, I mean, a valid question, but, um, you know, uh, I think what we're looking at in terms of, you know, in any given, whether it's Syria, whether it's North Korea, you know, well, you know, we want to see de escalation. We want to see political processes put in place. Uh, we want to see diplomatic processes put in place that can help resolve these tensions. A quick Please. question on the Palestinian and Israeli yes. issue. Very quick. Yes, uh, sure. First of all, is uh, the Secretary of State meeting? Uh, friend, uh, Palestinian President Abbas and Amman anytime soon? Uh, I d no, nothing to announce yet. Okay. Sorry. Uh, and second, uh, do you have any comment on uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu rejecting out of hand the French proposal? Uh, I uh, don't the French I, proposed a, a sure. international I mean, we, conference and he rejected it. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, I'm aware do of the remarks. Do you what he says? I mean, we're, we're looking at the, the fr uh, French plans. Um, uh, studying the proposal, we look forward to uh, engaging with the French and other parties, frankly, to uh, better understand uh, what their proposal entails. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I, can't, I can only speak for... Right. Did uh, they share it with you? What's that? The French? Did the French share it with um, you? We have been in touch with the French, um, and, uh, and we have shared their proposal. Thank you. Thanks.